as we observe this day um, which our Lord Jesus took on much suffering on our behalf when he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary to pay for our sin. And so I welcome you here tonight as we observe that. But more than that, as we celebrate the victory that he has won. Um, Amen? And so tonight uh, we are going to spend some time. We're going to look into God's word. We're going to spend some time singing songs of of praise to Jesus, our Lord. And you are going to meet a few people this evening as well. A few people who had an experience with the Lord Jesus on this night that he was betrayed. And I hope you pay attention to their stories and what they have to say as they reflect many of us. So, again, welcome I hope you are blessed by our time together as we thank the Lord for the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Let's go ahead and open tonight in prayer, shall we? Father God, we come before you this evening as we observe Good Friday, the night that our Lord was was killed on the cross of Calvary where he suffered unimaginable pain, unimaginable suffering on our behalf to pay for our sins, to purchase our redemption. We just pray as we go into the, tonight that your spirit would just be upon us, that, that you would just bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus, that you would move among us, help us to recognize the price that was paid for us, but also to see the victory that it contained. We just pray that you would receive all the honor and the glory for everything that happens here this evening. We thank you for this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you please turn to 327 in your hymnal. And um, let's stand together as we, as, we, as we worship.
may be seated. We're going to start this evening by reading God's Word, the account of Jesus' crucifixion. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 26. We're going to start in verse 69, and we're going to read through most of chapter 27. So if you want to open your Bibles and follow along, again, Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 69. God's word says, Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath, I do not know this man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind. And he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one of the prisoners whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, 
I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our, on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scoured, scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put on his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. And they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Nema, Sabakathathni. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing, hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saint who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him weeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to them. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus, He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. And said, Sir, we remember how that impostor said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people, He has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. We will hear from witnesses that were there 
who had an encounter with Jesus. I am Pilate's wife. I'm well educated and a Roman. I watched from the distance and heard all the rumors circulating about this Jesus, the one who claimed to be the Messiah. There was something different about him. I knew he was innocent. On the morning that Jesus' trial was, I sent my husband an urgent message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. I told my husband to have nothing to do with him, to ignore him and to walk away. Though he declined, I continued to watch. I should have said, we must pay the most careful attention to Jesus. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Instead, I counseled the one man who could have saved him to ignore him. Oh. Have nothing to do with him, I said. It seemed the safest thing to do. I was wrong. How about you? This began my journey to Jesus. I am Barabbas. Many may know me as a thief or the murderer. Do you look down upon me? Do you look down on a murderer who agitates others, who causes problems? Do you wish me out of existence, killed for my crimes? When you look at me, do you see Cain, who murdered his own brother? Do you think he got off too easily, exile instead of death, for having his noble brother's blood on his hands, crying out from the very soil. I've killed people. I've taken a life, maybe more. I've agitated others into mayhem and chaos, yet the crowd asked for my release. What shall I do with this Jesus? Pilate asked. God asked the same of you today. Do you ignore him? Do you consider him a liar or a lunatic? What legend? Do you refuse to have anything to do with him? Or do you accept his substitution in your place? I had nothing to do with him right up until the time he died in my place. I was so wrong. Are you? This is my journey to Jesus. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's what he said. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I've been a Roman legionnaire for nearly 10 years, and in all that time, I always knew what I was doing. I might not know why, but the orders were loud and clear. I've crucified scores of enemies of the Roman Empire, but never have one of them say, 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Most of them screamed in pain when we drove the spikes through their hands and feet. They thrashed around futilely, but in the end, they were all nailed to their crosses, struggling to breathe, dripping out their lives a drop of blood at a time. Some begged for mercy. Many of them cursed us. But never before have they forgiven us. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I don't know why those nine words haunt me so. Why I can't banish them from my mind. I can still see his eyes locked into mine when he said it. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is my journey to Jesus. They think I'm a nobody, only a servant girl. Always in the background, waiting on them, but never really noticed. Just like a piece of furniture. But they don't realize how much I see and know, and as long as I keep quiet and do my job, they don't really care either. I was there that morning, there in the background. I was curious. Of course I was. I like to know what's going on, and I like to be able to pass on the news to my own inner circle. It gives me some kind of status, being able to tell tales about the priestly goings-on. And if I'm treated like a piece of dirt by them, I can always pay them back and throw the dirt on them. I heard the religious leaders talking about how afraid they were of everyone believing and following Jesus. Why are these rich powerful men so scared of this rabbi. Everyone was talking about this Jesus and his followers. I ran into one of them. I think his name was Peter. But he denied it three times. But I know he was. Why did he deny knowing Jesus? Was he afraid of what everyone would say? Was he afraid of what it would cost him? What might it cost me if I follow Jesus? This is where my journey to Jesus began. I am Simon Peter. I grew up by the Sea of Galilee and am a fisherman by trade. Fishing is a hard life, but I'm good at it, and I expected to spend my entire life doing it. But one day, something happened that changed my life forever. My brother Andrew came and told me he had found the Messiah. We'd been looking for the Messiah all our lives, and I could scarcely believe my ears. I had never met anyone like Jesus before. His message was one of love and forgiveness. He spoke of the kingdom of God as being within us. I couldn't understand all that he said or what he meant. I just knew that I had to follow him. I saw him do great miracles. He made the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead live again. How could I not believe what he said when I saw him do these marvelous things? But things didn't go the way I expected this week. Instead of setting up his kingdom, he was arrested, tried, convicted, and crucified. My life is turned upside down. I don't know what to do. One minute, I was ready to slaughter everyone to save him. The next, I was denying I even knew him. I disowned the Son of God, my rabbi, my friend. Not once, not twice. Three times I said I did not know him. It seemed the safest thing to do. But I was not called to be safe. I was called to speak out. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for Jesus will save it. I knew this. 
but that is not what I said. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, I claimed. I don't know this man you're talking about. Just as I was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked right at me. I went outside and wept bitterly. I was so wrong. Are you? Follow me to Jesus. Each of these characters depicted here are examples of people on a journey to Jesus. People with very different backgrounds. Some good, some bad, some right in the middle. And each one had a slightly different encounter with Jesus. Some were very familiar with who Jesus was. They, maybe they followed him for a while. Others maybe were admirers, but they, they never really committed to him. Some had, had heard of this Jesus, the, but they, they didn't really understand the hubbub around him. Too wrapped up in their own lives to pay much attention. Others had a decidedly different set of morals and and life goals. They were living a life in complete rebellion to any authority, especially God's. And yet, and yet Jesus met each one right where they were. Met them right where they were. And they knew there was something about him. There is nobody like Jesus. Once they encountered Jesus, they, they would never be the same. The same is true for each of us. Jesus came into the world because of the problem of sin. Sin entered the world in the Garden of Eden because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Because of that, each of us are born with a, a sin nature. Every one of us has a desire, a propensity towards sin. Sin is just simply a rebellion against God and His ways. It's, it's doing things our way instead of His way to fulfill our fleshly desires. No matter how good you think you are, you still don't live up to God's standard. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Death, physical, spiritual, eternally, forever separated from Him. That's what each of us deserves because of our sin. But God's love, grace, and mercy is beyond our comprehension. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16 through 17, that God so loved the world, all of humanity, that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, in this world, into this world to save us. The rest of Romans 6, 23 tells us the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is why Jesus came to pay our sin debt, to give us eternal life. Jesus came into this world as a babe in a manger. He lived a sinless life. He performed great miracles. He turned water into wine. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind and the lame to walk again. He stood up for the marginalized, those without a voice, the, the widows and the orphans. He broke down class barriers. He, he pointed out the hypocrisy of the, the religious leaders in the temple system. He boldly confronted people and spoke hard truths unapologetically. Unapolog All of those things are true. 
But that is not why he came. Jesus came to die for us. He came to die for us. Sin had to be punished. Jesus Christ came to take upon himself the punishment each of us deserved. God sending Jesus and, and Jesus' willingness to suffer unspeakable humiliation, torture, and crucifixion comprise the greatest love story in history. Our minds cannot comprehend the depth of God's love toward us. And all he wants us to do is believe what his word, the Bible says, by faith. To put our trust into the work of Jesus, to pay our sin and redeem us. Jesus comes and he meets each of us right where we are. No matter our background, whether we lived a good life or, or a life of complete wickedness, that offer still stands today. He comes, he comes to meet us, offer forgiveness, the promise of eternal life. That's what he came for. That offer is still available today. If you don't know what that means, don't leave here tonight without accepting that gift. Come and see me afterwards on how you can know, how you can know that for sure. Not guaranteed tomorrow. Don't put it off until another day. Today is the day. He came for you. Holy Week is an incredibly important week in the Christian calendar. It's a week that we celebrate the, the most central truths of our faith. We, we celebrate the, the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, his, his triumphal entrance into Jerusalem, the Last Supper, his betrayal, his death and the resurrection in a couple days. Tonight, we're having a Good Friday service. We remember Jesus' death on a cross. I once heard someone jokingly ask, well, why do we call it Good Friday? It doesn't seem to me that it was a very good day for Jesus. And that seems like a good point. The day Jesus was crucified was a rough day understatement of the century, I know. Because of that, we can have a tendency to treat Good Friday service as though it's, it's Jesus' funeral. Many churches treat it that way, too. They'll have the lights turned down low, and have candles burning, and play somber music. Nobody really talks. But I think that misses something of the goodness of Good Friday. There is a deep and rich goodness that I think God wants us to celebrate about this day. And I want to share some reasons why Good Friday shouldn't be a funeral service for Jesus. Jesus' death was a victory. We're cut to the heart when we, when we read of Jesus' words from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We hear Jesus' words of pain. We, we get a glimpse into the suffering he experienced. He hung on the cross for you, for me. It's not something that we should ever brush past or, or take lightly. But what was actually happening in that moment? Was Jesus God forsaken? Many theologians have tried to imagine this moment. They've explained that Jesus was completely separated from the Heavenly Father. In this moment, the connection that had existed between the Heavenly Father and, and the Son from eternity past was, was completely severed. So when Jesus asks why God has forsaken him, it's because he feels the weight, that eternal separation in that, in that moment on the cross. But 
What if we're missing the entirety of the moment? What if Jesus is saying something more there? What if we've not properly understood Jesus' words in their context? When Jesus cried out to God, he was actually quoting a psalm from the Old Testament. Psalm 22, which was written by King David, begins with the very same words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The song is a lament, a song that cries out to God in pain. And as Jesus hung on the cross, he saw this psalm playing out before his very eyes. In Psalm 22, 6 and 8, through 8, it says that David's enemies were mocking him, specifically because he trusts in the Lord that the Lord would rescue him. It says, he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. 18, it says that his clothing was divided up as his oppressors were casting lots for them. His enemies are mocking him, wagging their heads at him, gloating and encircling him, it says. Jesus could relate. As he looked around. Matthew 27, 40. If you are the son of God, come down off that cross, they said. Verse 43. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. He was mocked. He was beaten. He had his clothes gambled for by the soldiers. Psalm 22 is is certainly a Masonic psalm. There's also a lament. Laments not only describe an unbearable situation that the author finds himself in, but they also declare dependence upon the Lord and gratitude for the grace of God. When Jesus Jesus cried out the first verse of this psalm, he was also calling out his dependence on God the Father and his gratitude for his faithfulness toward him. He recognized the desperation of humanity that suddenly was was upon his shoulders. And even in that agonizing moment, his voice called out to show that only God can deliver us by reminding us of this psalm. The psalm that Jesus was quoting didn't end in in a down note either. The psalmist remembers that God is still good. His promises are still true. There is still hope. Here are the the final verses of Psalm 22. Psalm 22, 25-31. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Did you catch the last line of that psalm? We shall proclaim to generation after generation that God has done it. What were Jesus' final words on the cross? It is finished. When Jesus surrendered his spirit, he didn't do, he didn't do it, he didn't die with a whimper. 
He yielded his, his spirit with a loud voice, a, a shout of strength. It is finished! Jesus' death was, was tragic. But it was not his defeat. It was the greatest moment of obedience. The moment that Satan lost forever. That moment the moment of Jesus' death, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. By Jesus' victory of obedience, the presence of God went out from the temple. The debt was paid. The pathway back to God was open for all. Anyone, everyone could experience God's forgiveness, grace, and mercy personally. Amen. When we celebrate Good Friday, we remember that Jesus died once for all. That means that we don't need to crucify him again every year. We don't need to subject ourselves to repeatedly watching the passion of the Christ or to gory descriptions of, about the horrors of crucifixion. Well, those things are horribly true, and, and knowing them does have their place. I think that there's an intentional purpose to what we read in our Bibles. Every word is there on purpose. The fact is that none of the four crucifixion narratives go into graphic detail about the physical suffering Jesus went through. Though it was excruciating, that's a word that literally means out of the cross. The point of the cru crucifixion story isn't the scandal or the indignity of Jesus' physical suffering. Nothing happened to Jesus that he was not in control of. He even told Pilate that in, in John 19. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Nothing happened to Jesus without his say-so. The point is that Jesus was making a once-for-all sacrifice for you and me. And the sacrifice is complete. The work is finished. Hebrews 10, 12 through 13. But when Christ had suffered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. His work is done. His work is done. The crucifixion story is about an act of love, an act of love for you and for me. The details that do stand out in the crucifixion narratives are all the ways that Jesus loved other people, even in the darkest moments of his earthly life. When Jesus looked at the people who were doing these horrible things to him, he prayed for their forgiveness because they didn't understand what they were doing. When Jesus hung next to a criminal, a man who deserved death, Jesus promised him paradise because of his faith. When Jesus looked at his mother and his friend John, he encouraged them by entrusting the care of his mother to John. He didn't leave them alone. And when his act of love was completed, he commended his spirit to the hands of the Father. This is what we remember of Good Friday. It's the ultimate act of love. The point of Good Friday service isn't that we would come to church and feel the weight of our guilt and shame, just so that we can be cleansed of it until next year's Good Friday service. Yes, we, we do remember that it was our sin that caused his pain and his death. But Jesus has already felt the weight of our sin and shame. We operate in a relationship now full of mercy and love. 
sacrifice. Jesus paid the penalty. He has reconciled us back to God. Do we still sin? Yes. Yes, unfortunately we do. Do we still need to repent from and and confess those sins? Absolutely. Do we still need to continually cleanse our hearts and, and seek after His righteousness to be obedient to the life Jesus is calling us into living? Absolutely. And may it be the calling of our lives. The point of Good Friday is that we now have the means to draw near to God. And we can draw near to God with confidence because of what Jesus did. This is the relationship that Jesus has made possible for us because of his death on the cross. Jesus gave his life so that we might experience abundant life through him. The point of Good Friday isn't death. The point of Good Friday is life. It's life. Jesus gave his life so that you and I could have life. He gave his life so that we could experience an abundant kind of life eternally. So Good Friday isn't a funeral service. It's a celebration of everything that Jesus has done for us. It's a rallying point of our greatest victory. Even in death, Satan could not win. Jesus experienced victory in his death, and so will we. Amen. Death has lost its sting. Everything has been swallowed up in his victory. Jesus' last words are not a pleasant phrase. They're, They're full of despair. It was misunderstood by those close by when he said it, and often is to today. To fully understand it, we must read it in the appropriate context of Psalm 22. Cannot leave it by itself. All of Scripture must be read in context. Jesus knew his followers would understand when they remembered this psalm. Jesus wants us to look through the lens of that psalm so that we fully understand it too. Yes, that was a moment of ultimate pain and loss as only the burden of sin could cause. At the same time, there was still hope in the promise of God's deliverance. There would be a resurrection on the other side of death. Psalm 22 shows us Jesus' utter dependence upon God, even even when he could not feel anything but the weight, the sin of the world. We're invited to do the same in our lives, to depend on God, to trust in his love, believe, believe that eternal life is offered to us through the sacrifice of Jesus, his son. Good Friday is not a funeral service. It's a celebration of what Jesus has done. We will remember, and we will remind ourselves, and we will celebrate that by observing communion together here now. The men who are going to serve communion, if you can come forward. Jesus tells us, when we, do, when we do this, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, that we are to do this in remembrance of Him. To do this in remembrance of Him. Proclaim it in, in His death until He comes. Just as Psalm 22 tells us at the end. Well, Paul wrote the Corinthians. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. We offer an open communion. You don't have to be a member of Faith Chapel. You just have to be a member of the family of God. But you must first examine yourself. If you have something in your life, you have some unconfessed sin, if you have an issue with a brother or a sister, if you're not in right standing, let the elements pass. Let the elements pass. Don't worry about what the person next to you may think, their judgment. Don't worry about their judgment. Worry about the Lord's judgment. Okay? Bob, will you pray for the bread? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, and we are thankful for this bread, Lord, this bread which is representative of the body of Christ, which was broken, and he died for our sins. God bless this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he gave him thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Father God, we thank you for your blood because your word says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The blood that was shed for us is pure. It's holy. It's righteous. It's life-giving. It's life-changing. So, Father, we pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit through your blood would touch each and every heart here tonight, every life here tonight, God, with a smile, with an embrace, with a kiss of God. In Jesus' name. The same way he also took the cup after supper. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Scripture says, after they had supper, they sang a song and went out. But we're going to close with a song. Please turn to 330 in the hymnal. And let's stand together as we close in worship.
That's the most important question you can answer. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Every one of us, every person has a journey to Jesus. To become washed as white as snow. Wherever you are, make sure that you take that journey. That you meet Jesus. That you invite Him in. He will come wherever you are. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now as we leave here, don't go away sad. Yes, Jesus is, is in the tomb. But it's not, it's not defeat. It's victory. And in a couple days, we'll be in here rejoicing as we celebrate His resurrection. Amen? Go. So go in joy for the Lord and what He has done. Amen? Amen. You're dismissed. We have a time of fellowship in the back, and we'd welcome you to come and stay and just fellowship with us. Thank you for coming.